Brilliant. Okay. Welcome, folk. Appreciate that. Andrea, Nicole, appreciate you folk being here. Just give us a five minutes. We'll just get through the, the opening necessities of a meeting. Otherwise, we look forward to hearing what you folk have to say. Um, so, look, can I just uh, deal with the... Um, well, Christy, welcome. Our last meeting for the year. Um, our staff certainly have a very Merry Christmas background to their, uh, their backdrops. Um, unlike the rest of us, but I'm sure we'll get there somewhere about the 25th, won't we? Hey, um, let's just uh, roll through uh, the basic necessities. Um, apologies, Ken, you've, you've mentioned, Jim, it's an apology for the whole day, Gary, for lateness. Uh, everybody else able to be here for the rest of the meeting? I think we're here till probably around about three o'clock, according to the run sheet. Anybody need to apologise for needing to dip out early? Yeah, I might have to... Uh go for about half an hour around midday, Bruce, but well, half an hour. Be... We're taking a break at 12.30. I don't know if that helps at all, Andrew. Otherwise, we'll let you um, uh, drop out and I presume you're back for the afternoon session, eh? We'll reconvene yep. at one o'clock. Yep. Okay, look, I'll move from the chair that we sustain uh, those apologies, Jim, Gary Lateness and Andrew for a bit of time in the middle of the day. Thank you, Roger. I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. Those against? It's carried. Ken, remind me of our, our process for voting here. Hands up or do they all have to shout aye? I never quite. that They differ all around the place. I just want to make certain that I do know that we do vote. Yeah. Oh, look, um, look, Bruce, I'm not sure we've got an established um, protocol oh, okay. there. Um, yeah, I, I think it is still generally on the voices. I, okay. I, suspect, right, yeah. I, suspect, I suspect, though, that if somebody is wanting to, to vote against a resolution, they should probably wave um, vigorously to, to make sure that that is that's voted. Right. Okay. <laughs> as long as it's not a motion I'm putting, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, are there any matters of interest um, uh, relating to the agenda members need to raise? There being none. Uh, Ken, no late items that I've been aware no. of. So I think we're trucking through no. with the plan as we sit. And it's pretty much in the order of the meeting. And as, as um, has been hinted, by, um, uh, we would like to get through the open session this morning, which I propose to uh, finish by 12.30 so we can take a break at one. And from then we will be in public excluded. That's brilliant. So the, the meeting is confirmed. I don't think we need to have a motion about that. Can we please move to the uh, minutes, please, for uh, our last time we met on the 20th, well, it is the, yes, the 20th of um, uh, September, uh, which wasn't the last time we met, but was the last quarterly meeting. Um, are there any matters of accuracy uh, or um, uh, uh, corrections that need to be made to those folks? There being none, I'll move from the chair that they are accepted as a correct record. A second, second to please. Thank you, Claire. I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against? It's carried. Uh, the other set of minutes um, was uh, the, uh, well, the, the convened and reconvened meeting over the last couple of weeks over the adoption of the annual report, which Andrea and Nicole, for your benefit, we're glad to say we got there. So um, that's tremendous. So again, um, are there any matters of um, correctness or accuracy that we need to think in terms of these minutes? There being none, again, I will put the motion, sorry, I will move the motion that these accept as a true and correct record. Thank you, Claire, seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those against? It's carried, thank you very much. Right, now we're into business. The parliamentary report on risk management observations. <laughs> Andrea, welcome to the meeting and, and Nicole as well. Welcome. It's, it's always great to uh, um, hear your insights and have your input to the, the process. As I say, look, we, we um, before you say, we did get through the audit. Um, I think Leon and Ken and their respective teams spent a fair bit of time uh, but we were grateful we got there in the end. So it's nice to be meeting you with the signed audit report. Might have been a different discussion if it wasn't signed, but hey, that's not a problem this time around. So thank you for that, Andrea. Um, look, obviously, we we did um, work with you in terms of delivery of this report. Um, and uh, I know that um, uh, members of the committee have had a chance to glance at it. So look, I'd be very keen to hear what you and Nicole have to say, Andrea, about it, and the floor is yours. Perhaps about perhaps about 
I don't know how long, 10 to 15 minutes, and then I'll take some questions. Is that fit with you? Andrew? Yeah, look, um, away, kia ora koutou, everyone. Um, well, we've got a bit of a presentation that we'll just put up on screen. We're not going to talk to all of the slides um, by any stretch of the imagination. I'd suggest that we'd probably speak for, you, you know, um, at most 10 minutes because it's right. really kind of important to allow the committee um, to be able to ask some questions of us. Um, so hopefully you can see. Um, yeah, we're good to go. Screen. Good to go, Andrea. Oh, good. That was the first hurdle. Um, <laughs> is making sure I could get there. So um, uh, just some observations, and and um, we tabled this report in Parliament um, in October um, of this year. We are actually, in fact, going to speak to the Governance and Administration Committee on Wednesday. Um, this week on this report also and just sharing with them our observations. Now that's just a standard process um, that we follow in tabling any report in Parliament. We get called in by Select Committee to offer our insights and highlight um, key area, uh, you know, key areas of focus, why we undertook the work, what we found, um, etc. And we're just going to take you through some of those um, key messages today. Um, Look, but what I will start with is um, we undertook this work by undertaking case studies of four councils and we sent a survey to other councils as well as the knowledge that we have um, in our, you know, in our capacity and the work that we do. Um, and I guess the key piece of feedback that I would give for Waipa District Council is it's clear that there's a culture of continuous improvement um, in regards to risk management at the council. Um, and that's demonstrated uh, through the journey um, that your council has been on um, in terms of learning and improving its approach to risk management. Um, look, in undertaking this work, what do we expect to see um, by local authorities? Um, well, we wanted firstly to see that councils have a risk management framework in place. Um, that was the first thing that we were looking at. Um, but of course, you know, having a framework in place is only part of the story. Um, you always want to ensure that there are uh, effective um, ways for an approaches, approaches across an organisation for entities to be able to identify and manage risk and um, have that culture of risk management across an organisation. Um, and also with effective oversight um, by elected members and including the Audit and Risk Committee. Um, we expected to see regular formal reviews of risk management practices um, that inform areas for improvement and of course mechanisms in place um, for communicating um, with communities about the risks that they face and how managing those risks. Now that latter bullet point um, wasn't necessarily covered in much depth in this report. Um, but I, what I would say as a bit of a teaser is um, later this week, we will be um, tabling another report in Parliament around long-term plan consultation documents and what we saw. And what um, the key message is in that report is that I think council should be commended for the way in which they highlighted some of the significant challenges that they're currently facing um, and the fact that they, across the board, had quite clear, courageous conversations, I think, with communities as they tackled quite significant um, funding challenges to address um, some of the, the issues that they have. So that's a high-level um, message coming out of that report. And as I say, that will be tabled later in the week. Um, but in terms of this report, I will um, hand over to Nicole to talk about what we did actually find through our work. Thanks, Andrea. So um, the first key finding um, was that some, we found that some councils do not have a formal risk management framework. Um, of the 63 councils that answered our survey on this topic, 55 said that they had a risk management framework. Um, it's of our view that those councils who do not have one should prioritise putting a formal risk management framework in place. Um, it's also important to note that of the eight councils who said they didn't have one, um, seven said that they were currently in the process of preparing one. 
Uh, as Andrea mentioned, we, we did see several positive examples of a strong risk culture in the councils that we looked at. Um, effective risk management is not just about systems and processes, it is also how staff implement it in their day-to-day -day work. We found that our case study councils had a good focus and a maturing approach to risk management. And we did hear um, examples of a strong risk culture from WIPA. Um, we heard that in 2018, your council had consultants complete a maturity assessment of its risk management framework as a way to identify areas for improvement and how they would achieve this maturity in this area. Another key finding was that many councils lack someone responsible for leading and monitoring risk management processes throughout their council. Um, our survey asked councils whether they had a ded dedicated risk manager. 35 councils said that they did have one and 25 councils said that they did not. Of the 15 of those 25 councils who didn't have one said it was either because they were too small or that it was unaffordable. Although not all councils can afford to have a dedicated risk manager, they should have someone responsible for enabling and encouraging good risk management practices. Uh, the risk manager is not responsible for managing risks. Um, but helps to lead and monitor risk management processes throughout the council. We also found that more could be done to support elective members. Um, we found that councils generally recognise the need to do more in terms of training and development and have ongoing conversations so that elective members and staff understand their role in managing risk. Um, in particular, elected members need to be able to make informed decisions about how they deliver their council's objectives um, that, have, that have been sent, set in consultation with their community. Um, they also need to understand the implications of these decisions. Uh, we found that elected members often receive information about a council's risk management activities and their role in risk management as part of their post-election induction. Um, however, we found that subsequent workshops or training sessions often did not happen. Some examples um, we found of council supporting staff and elected members um, from Queenstown Lakes District Council, that they have a risk management intranet page with resources, um, and that they also provide internal training on new aspects of its risk management process, processes to some staff. Um, staff with their stronger risk management backgrounds run this training. Another example we heard was from Auckland Council, who provide risk management frame, uh, risk management training to staff and elected members in conjunction with its organisational development programs. Um, and this includes Kurakawa, which is an elected member development program. The final finding I just want to touch on is um, in terms of specialist tools such as quantitative risk assessment could be more widely applied. We heard from WIPA about the risk management guidelines that it provides to staff to help improve the consistency of risk management practices throughout the organisation. The guidelines provide different approaches to identifying risks, tools for analysis and guidance. This includes writing risk statements, explanations of the likelihood and consequence of ratings and how these translate into risk assessments and suggested treatment options. Quantitative risk analysis or assessment can assist councils in decision-making by providing a probability associated with particular outcomes. This would give managers and governors a better understanding of the risks, delivering complex programs of work and how they could reduce their exposure to those risks. Thanks, Nicole. So um, I'm just gonna skip over a slide. I mean, that one talks about the top risks that were identified by councils, which are incredibly wide ranging. Um, across the board and reflecting the, the unique, um, unique nature of councils um, and, and the issues that they have to manage. Um, but we did specifically raise four recommendations in our report. And of course, Nicole's touched on many of those in terms of our findings. Um, so our, our recommendations are very much aligned to our findings. Um, and probably I'll, I'll touch on a couple of them. Um, and Nicole talked about the, the need to provide and support elected members um, to get the training and support they need to carry out their risk management roles and responsibilities. 
I guess what we've observed in our work is that um, many councils have been on quite a journey with their risk management um, processes and establishing them internally, including putting frameworks in place, thinking about the maturity and engaging with elected members and audit and risk committees um, in terms of starting to build mechanisms to get the right governance in place. Um, but then I think what's needed or the next step in that maturity is needing to make sure that the, the risk management frameworks that councils have, or at least the management of those risks, is getting full visibility around the council table. Certainly um, it's great and we recognise that all councils across New Zealand have an audit and risk committee in place and they're an important mechanism um, to govern you know, risk management. But ultimately, it's the full council that takes responsibility for risk management in an organisation. And so there needs to be that awareness across the um, full council. And let's face it, um, very few of us are risk management experts. Um, so there is a need for ongoing training and development there. Um, the third one is around the, the more sophisticated techniques for identifying and managing um, risks on key programmes of work. Um, and so... We've, we've highlighted one such um, technique being a quantitative risk assessment. Um, you know, it, it's a modelling technique that makes risks and the financial impact of those risks um, more explicit when making key decisions. And we certainly recognise that councils and elected members are making um, quite significant decisions um, on a frequent basis. Um, and we didn't see those kind of techniques um, used often in our local government sense. And so... We do think that there is merit in doing that. Um, the Treasury uh, does have some information on its website in regards to um, some of the, the techniques um, that can be used um, in that regard. And I think uh, our final point is that councils assess their desired level of risk management maturity and have a clear plan to achieve that. Um, but I'd say that that was the one thing that we... Um, I guess praised WIPA for in our report and having that clear process in place. Uh, so I'm going to pause there um, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. I'll also stop sharing. Thanks, thanks, but Andrea, that's um, that's tremendous to get that start. Members, are the questions you'd have, for Andrea or Nicole, at this stage? Yes, Roger. Yes, thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, really, really interesting. And thank you very much for the report, Andrea and Nicole. And I go back to your first page and where you identified uh, the point of communicating with your community. And to me, that's um, quite a difficult task. I mean, having uh, been a member of this committee for two years, I know the learning curve that I've gone through to understand the processes and uh, to fully understand all of our charts that we produce. And I'm wondering how realistic is it? You know, the community probably don't have the same level of learning or understanding. Um, and is there a chance that they could go off on a tangent, an uninformed tangent, and perhaps get false impressions of the risk that council has. Yeah, absolutely. I, thank you. That's an excellent question. I think um, in terms of our expectations around communicating with communities, of course, when we looked at this um, report, we're not risk management experts. So we, we really stepped back and said, you know, um, what is risk management? And it's, it's looking at, you know, what is the risk to an organisation or a council? Well, it's anything that would get in the way of you achieving your strategic objectives. Um, and, you know, you'll have processes internally um, to manage those risks and think about those risks. Um, clearly, if you're pushing um, and using that framework to communicate, I think you are you do run the risk that you articulated that, you know, it could mislead communities. But I think there are other mechanisms within local government to have those conversations. Um, in particular, through um, you know annual plans, through long-term planning processes, those kind of things, and you know, hence my point around 
actually during the latest round of consultation on the long-term plans themselves, councils were very clear around, well, these are our strategic objectives and these are the things that could start to get in the way of us achieving those. Um, and many of those related to um, asset management, um, you, you know, and I'm, I'm giving a broad brush right across the sector here. Um, we saw much more sophisticated conversations by councils around where they were at in terms of being able to maintain their assets and have really clear conversations with their communities about the likely implications of that. So it's really about using those other opportunities to translate, but um, it's challenging because councils provide such a raft array, vast array of services to their communities. Mm. I, th I think, again, that's interesting because, um, you know, the long-term plan and the annual plans, um, when you go out into the community, the majority of the community are just really wanting to say, will those potholes be fixed? Are yeah. my rates going to go up? Is the pool going to be open? And that's really what they're concerned with. If you start going into detail about risk, I mean, we've got a challenge with them reading the copious amounts of detail that come out anyway. So yeah. I'm wondering how effective a technique that would be to include it in annual plan and long-term plan document or consultation exercises. Yeah, I, I think I'm perhaps suggesting that we see it already happening um, in quite an effective way. Yeah, oh. yeah I'd like to see if... if there's areas that you point us to where we can have a look at that kind of inclusion and be grateful on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, we've held out this example in previous forums, um, like the Central Hawke's Bay District Council's um, uh, consultation document um, was very good, but also White Pass was excellent. So, um, you know, it, it's just been recognised also across the sector. So, yeah. Good. Thank you. Roger, I, um, it's interesting, you must look at my notes because I wanted to ask Andrea that she said effectively the same question about um, uh, uh, mechanisms to, to essentially tell the community about your risk framework. Um, and it does strike me the importance of um, what Jenny does with our quarterly risk report, which, um, okay, it's buried in a bunch of minutes, um, but I think uh, Jenny is starting to hit of straps and the way it's used. Um, and my view would be that actually this would be quite a good launch if we were to try and have a more uh, risk-focused form of communication, certainly with councillors, if not broader afield. Um, because it is it is in one, well, three, three A, A4 pages um, um, showing just about everything is a snapshot, which I think is incredibly valuable, both for us as a committee, but I would say council and ultimately reporting to the community. So um, I think that's really important. The other thing, the other thing um, I was just going to note, probably for the benefit of everybody, is there is still a debate around the sector as to whether these risks should be in, um, uh, uh, in public session or PX, Andrea. And I'm glad to say WIPA has been early in being in um, uh, open agenda, uh, whereas a number are still trying to do it in PX, and I, I don't, I've come to the view I can't, I can't see why. There may be aspects we've got to discuss in PX, um, but I'm strongly of the view that this stuff should be done uh, in public, and I'm glad. Well, actually, Ken, I don't think we've ever done it in in pub PX, so perhaps I should, perhaps I'm making it sound like YPA has been on a journey, but in fact, it's been leading the way. So. So well done. But that's a good question, Roger. And I think, and I think, you know, Andrea, Nicole, your point about actually how we talk with the community about those barriers in our normal documents rather than something separate is really important. Andrea, you've got your hand up, buddy. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Um, just listening to Roger's question, and yeah, I've been a councillor now. This is my third term, and when I came into Council, I, I guess, you know, looking back, my knowledge of local government was um, extremely limited, which I, which I think is probably true for a great deal of the, of the general public. And one of the things that struck me is, and I don't think it's as well communicated as it could be, but how critically important the long-term plan is um, if you are wanting to get a project done. If, so if a member of the public wants to get something 
happening in their community, um, the only realistic way of doing it is by addressing the next long-term plan. And people, I don't think, understand that. So I, I feel we could communicate the critical let me just say the importance <laughs> of, 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 you know, say. <laughs> um, of, of the long-term plan in, in getting, like, achieving outcomes uh, um, for the public. So, yeah, you know, what you were saying earlier just brought that to my mind. Mm -hmm. So, and thanks for the report. It was really good. Cheers. Yeah, clear. Um, yeah, um, thanks, Andrea and Nicole. Um, wonderful report. I mean, my question is around those quantitative um, techniques that um, WIPA doesn't appear to be using. Um, like, have you got an, uh, sort of a, an opinion as to why councils don't um, use that approach um, and how they might be sort of encouraged to make better use of them? And I'd also like to know from Ken whether or not WIPA has considered them and, and perhaps... Um, you know, is there a plan to make better use of them and things like that? But Andrew and Nicole first, please. Uh, look, I don't think that that's um, isolated to WIPA at all. I think that um, the use of these kind of techniques um, has been evolving over a period of time. So, you know, you're probably a relatively new concept across the board. Um, it is something that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, central government um, require through their better, better business case processes. So this is where we're starting to see, um, you know, the, the requirements that are elsewhere in the public sector. And we're just saying, actually, you know, local authorities are making decisions that are um, just as large, if not more. Um, and thus, you, you know, it's becoming sort of mandated, not mandated, but more common in the central government space. Um, so just encouraging local authorities to turn their minds to what more can be done in that space is, is probably the key requirement. So I'd categorise it as rather than as an omission by the sector is really kind of the next steps in the maturity of decision making is probably where I'd yeah, focus. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Okay, and um, Ken, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, so um, yeah, so th th through the chair and an an answer to um Councillor Sophia's um question. So um yeah, look, I um I've taken quite a bit of heart out of this um out of this report and and obviously the the, the mentions made of WIPA as a as a case study both both in the report and and in the comments from the Auditor General's office this morning. Um yeah, well look, we've um yeah we've clearly um clearly been on a journey. Um, but um yeah, but look um yeah, as has been recognised this morning, this is this is all about um, continuous improvement, and, and yes, we, we have very much had a continuous improvement in this space, um, as well as in, in a bunch of other spaces um, across, across the council. A, a couple of things that I've sort of um, taken out of this, perhaps for the um, yeah, perhaps for the continuing um, journey ahead, uh, are that um, that that whole issue of um, of of wider um, wider knowledge and understanding of um, of risk management, uh, yeah, you know, among among. Um, yeah, yeah, you know the the full the full council, um, and, and in fact that is something that um yeah that we've um we've recognised um prior to this um yeah you will recall that um a meeting or two ago um, we went through our annual um annual um survey process um so um yeah so um Andrew and Nicole not not sure if you do realise but uh, actually I think you do realise actually we we've always um since uh, the creation of this committee six or seven years ago um run an annual survey and um and one of the I guess the key takeouts of the um, of the last one was that yeah, you know there is definitely a gap um, in, in terms of risk management knowledge of um, of the members of this committee and uh, yeah, you know the the wider council. Um, so so that is something that we've we've already recognised and committed to um to, to closing that gap. Um, and um, yeah, so so very interested that, that that kind of is quite a quite a key finding that you've um, yeah that, that you've got in your report and talked to this morning. Um, yeah, the, the, the other one is the, is the one. Um, um, yeah, Councillor Sampia, that you have just raised um, in, in regard to um, a quantitative risk assessment.
assessment look um yeah you know something that we haven't um turned out turned our our minds to particularly um up till now but um yeah but in terms of a continuous improvement journey um going forward um yeah I'm, I'm sure that's something that we as a team can look at and just uh, and just look at um at what we can do in that space um I noticed um Andrea that you um you know, you referred us to the um to the treasury website um so yeah I'd suggest that the, the team have a have a bit of a look at that and um and start thinking about that in, in terms of the continuous journey. Thanks, Ken. Brilliant. That's brilliant, Ken. Look, um, just as we come to a close, Jenny, George, I wonder whether there's anything as as the uh, the people that carry this on your shoulders, whether there's any comment you'd like to make for the benefit of the committee and Andrew and Nicole. Uh, Mr Chair, Susan's got a, her hand up. Oh, sorry. Susan, you have two. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, th thanks, Bruce. Look, my apologies. I'm having real problems with my video this morning, which is um, quite annoying. And I've had to move my stuff to a point where I've got glare behind me, so I hope it's not interfering too much. Hey, look, um, thank you for your report. I um, just wanted to add in terms of that um, um, skill or knowledge, if you like, and understanding of risk management um, for our members and of this committee and elected members in a broader sense. Um, just wanted to note that I did the... Um, the um, director's course um, and, and in December, which predated my, because I was one of the members um, surveyed and for the creation of um, the parts to do with YPAR on this. And I found that the Institute of Directors um, our directorship course was invaluable and really made a hot, I mean, I'm in my fifth year now at, at council, but it, a lot of pennies dropped doing that course and in particular, the importance of this space and, and, and the work that we do. So um, I, I'm a bit loath to admit that I took a long time for that to drop, but that's a really, really good um, course to try and encourage um, um, people who are interested in this space and getting a, a greater understanding to, to go on because it, well, I found it invaluable. It was really, really good. Thanks, Susan. George, Jenny, any comments you want to add at this stage? Um, no, just probably to reinforce what, what Ken has said. Um, we um, really value the report. It um, sort of helped to ratify for us that we, we were heading in the right direction um, and some new areas to look at. But as Ken said, it's a continuous improvement journey um, and it will take a, a, you know, a long time to, to get to where we want to get to. But um, yeah, it, it, I thought it was a really helpful report. Great. Thank you. Jenny, final say by the, by the feeling, by the sounds of oh, Just to reiterate what George and Ken have said, and we'll certainly, I'll be having a look at the Treasury website and seeing what we can put in our toolbox. Great. Well, Andrea and Nicole, is there anything else you need to add at this stage, or have you um, run out of course? Probably uh, just two additional thoughts. Um, one thing that we're looking to do as an office is um, I've already had a conversation with the Treasury to, to start to kind of link up to see what further support we can give the sector in, um, in this area um, because it is something that's relatively new so um, that's something that we'll continue to do and um, I talk to people across the sector about um, you know um, one very uh, wise um, Audit and Risk Committee Chair um, said to me in doing this work that risk management's a journey, it's not a destination, and we very much um, consider our work in this space a bit of a journey as well, um, especially as we support uh, the local government sector, but um, just to reinforce the positive um, aspects that we found at Waipa District Council. It was great to be able to share that um, with the rest of the sector. So thank you um, to everyone that was involved because, you know, learning um, from others and the journey that they've been on is one of the best ways to, to make improvements yourself. So really do appreciate the engagement that we had across staff and elected members. Um, and of course yourself, um, Bruce, in undertaking this work. Yeah, thank you for all of that, Andrea and Nicole, again. Um, and look, what under the office, uh, this is live stuff for us. So to get this sort of feedback, not just the fact that you included YPAR in it, um, but that actually you looked across the sector is really uh, valuable. And um, look, as the independent, I just want to reinforce the 
the culture and the environment that I've seen WIPA um, both in the past, but also wanting to move through the organisation um, and Jenny's great work, particularly in internalising it within the organisation, which is uh, still a big area, I think, for development for many councils. So, um, look, great report. Thank you for that. Um, uh, hopefully, some indication to you and at the office, Andrea and Nicole, that we have actually internalised, we read this, uh, we do take watch it with interest, not the least because our name's there, um, but actually we're also trying to look through for all those lessons that come out of it. So um, uh, thank you for that. And hopefully, ultimately, this reflects through in our regular um, self-assessment, but also when we have the uh, the odd external maturity review shows that our arc of development's continuing. So that's good. Thank you, folk. And now I just wonder if I could move. Oh, sorry, Ken. Oh, oh, Bruce. So, so I wonder if this is an opportunity because because I'm very conscious that um that um that Andrea is is moving on from her um yeah, her current role right. yeah, in, the, in the not too distant future. <laughs> and, 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 and and look, I know um yeah you know Andrea has made an outstanding um contribution to the sector. So I just think it would be quite nice to um you know to acknowledge that this morning, given given we've got this opportunity. Thank you, Ken. Much appreciated. Yes, well said, Ken and, and Andrea. Um, uh, well, I said it to you personally, but I think I can say it with, from my part too. Best wishes, and uh, we look forward to see what you do. Uh, <laughs> but we also we also very much um, value and and will be keen to see that your successor uh, keeps up that periodic uh, contact with us as Waipa District, and um, certainly you've set a very good standard. So thank you for your work. Do appreciate it. Kind of just move to the motion, folk, which is uh, simply that we receive the report. And secondly, we do thank the Office of the Auditor General staff, so that's Andrew and Nicole, obviously, for the presentation, and more importantly, for their insights. It's been grateful. Thank you, Roger. Appreciate you seconding that. I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Again. Those against? It's carried. Thank you, folk. We'll let you get on with your day, Andrew and Nicole. And uh, again, appreciation and, and all the best. And uh, seen it's that month. Merry Christmas. Indeed. And um, <laughs> thank you very much for having us today. Thanks. No worries, you guys. Catch you later. See ya. Bye. Well, now that we've got some uh, some insight into risk management and the, indeed uh, um, Jenny, some praise and George. We better deal with our quarterly risk management report, which uh, I'll leave with George or Jenny to kick us off with salient points, and then we'll open up for committee members. So it's me today. Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'll take the report as read. Not surprisingly, COVID has dominated this quarter, and the committee should note the emerging risks on the quarterly report. Um, and obviously, it's a fast-moving area. An update on the COVID decisions to date, um, we are currently having consultation with staff with the council proposing a policy of mandating all staff to be vaccinated unless medically exempt. Um, this consultation closes 13th of December. Council is also mandating indoor facilities, so that's the customer service front counters, libraries, TA museum, council chambers and community rooms, and council managed community halls in the pounds, um, will only be accessed by over 12 year olds who have a vaccine pass. Go Waipa announced that they will require vaccine passes for admittance to the pools and the event centre on Thursday, the 25th of November. There's been some negative community feedback, including threats of litigation. Um, we're treating all these requests as legoimas, and the memo approved by the CE for mandating vaccine passes at our indoor facilities includes legal commentary and has been posted on our website. Implementation of the this mandated vaccine pass at council facilities will be from 8 a.m. Monday, 13th of December, so this time next week. Um, it will be reviewed on a regular basis. Staff are also accessing information on webinars from central government and the local government response unit. This includes information about and from the regional leadership group. Other things this quarter, we've 
provided the draft risk and policy format in the, in the new format, it will go through a formal approval process and come back to you with the guidance materials. But we wanted to give you give it to you to get some initial thoughts on the new look. As discussed before, this new approach is linked to the development of Pōtātaki, our draft organisational charter. Um, do you want to take questions or do you want me to move on to the quarterly risk report as well, Bruce? Um, well, look, let's just stop with the COVID in the first, the first instance and, and the draft report. I mean, the COVID stuff would naturally lead on to the quarterly report because it dominates the quarterly report. Um, but look, I'm sure you folk at BIPA, and I'm talking to my members here, um, have been going through the process, the journey to use the word, um, of moving to a, a COVID position, um, uh, actually fairly consistent with the rest of the sector, although not universal. Um, um, so look, thank you for that update. And I must confess, I'll be interested to go to the website and read what Gary's written, Jenny. Um, is there any discussion uh, around this from a risk perspective um, uh, that, that members want to raise at this stage? Um, I'm interested that you've had the odd legal or threatened legal challenge. Um, certainly it's heightening a level of um, risk for staff around the country. Um, but I just wonder if there's anything in particular that members wanted to raise at this point around the COVID state. I suspect you're well aware of it, but um, yes, Roger. Chairman Bruce, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of our decision to impose that mandate, I personally do agree with it, but this, this is a question, I suppose, of Gary. Um, what risk is there with popping that mandate in on our um, level of service and capability within council on a long-term position? Because, you know, we, we know that um, good staff are difficult to come by. And I'm just wondering, hopefully, that we won't see too much of a long-term impact. But I'd be really interested in your, your views on that risk, Gary. So critically, well, there are two issues. One is um, we're currently consulting on compulsory um, a compulsory vaccination mandate for all staff. Um, and once we have received that feedback, we then need to consider whether we're going to implement uh, compulsory vaccinations. Um, I've told staff at the moment we're leaning in that direction, and that's the that's the um, the likely outcome of this consultation. What well, what will then come from that, Roger, is a decision around um, if we have got staff that are refusing to be vaccinated or are are not medically exempt, then how is is there a way in which we can accommodate those people working from home by way of example? And, and there are likely to be a number of staff that we can accommodate in that way. Um, but, but critically, once we did our risk assessment, um, there was something like 60% of um, teams in the organisation who have close contact um, with customers. And um, there's a strong likelihood of um, bringing COVID into the organisation along those lines. And then once you run a risk management, the business continuity lens over those teams to see, well, what happens in the organisation if the biggest percentage of those teams are unable to work because they've, they've come down with COVID? Um, that, that's the thing that exposes the organisation um, to the most in, impact in terms of not being able to deliver levels of service. And when you can consider the criticality of some of those services we deliver, um, it, it really makes those vaccine mandates quite important. Um, critically, though, we need to have this discussion with staff and, and then consider whether there are other ways in which we can accommodate um, the, the different range of concerns about vaccinations or not. So it's a process and we're very much aware uh, of the, the need to continue to deliver the, the key services um, even when, you know, we've got um, modelling showing that once the borders open with Auckland, 
Um, you might have 10% of your population over 12 unvaccinated. You've got your under 12s un unvaccinated. You know, there's a really real, a real risk that this thing is um, is going to take hold. So, so we've, we're taking a cautious approach and uh, the, ma the main concern is maintaining those levels of service. Mm. Susan, I think if you're still there, you had your hand up. Yeah, look, I was just trying to find the memorandum that um, that Gary had circulated on the website, and it was a little bit secure to reach to find it, but I found it now. It's all good. Oh, great. Okay. Any uh, other questions? Perhaps, um, Gary, Gary, that, Gary, that's, Gary. The other, that's the other question, and that was around um, mandating um, vaccine passes for clients who might attend our buildings. Um, and so uh, we've gone through a similar... Uh, risk assessment and business continuity assessment and that was pulled together um, uh, by a team here at WIPA when having considered all those risks and they have prepared a memorandum for me which I've considered and the recommendation was that we do mandate um, vaccine passes for the built for all of the buildings because of the reasons I've just articulated with the staff so um, we're getting a lot of uh, queries around how can this decision be made and, and that's why we've published that memorandum on the website um, and make it, we're making it freely available to people so that they understand the rationale for that. Yeah. So are there, I mean, I think there are, are live risks. Perhaps we'll come back to that with Jenny's quarterly report. But Gary, is, is there any particular risk that, that, that is, shall we say, yeah, let's use the old phrase, keeping you awake at night around this around the COVID front. Roger's obviously raised level of service. Are there any other aspects that, that are on your mind? I, I guess that the main thing about COVID is um, the level of uncertainty that it, it provides to all of the assumptions that we base our planning on. And so... Um, Critically, you know, in an economic sense, um, notwithstanding dire predictions, you know, the economy boomed over the last 12 months. Um, now, that hasn't got necessarily everything to do with COVID, but we are worried that uh, once we move through this traffic light system and if um, we get levels of infection, you know, in, in the Waikato in the order of, say, four or five hundred per week what will that do to the economy how are we going to support those people um, and so I think it's the you know the economic assumptions underpinning the way in which the organization works that that is a is the biggest concern yeah have you given help us that gives rise to a amendment to long-term plan Gary but <laughs> it's probably the least of the worries in this situation Okay, yes, Claire. Um, yeah, well, um, one concern I have with the vaccine mandate is that if you have staff that, for whatever reason, aren't going to be vaccinated and they can't be accommodated, you know, with remote working, the consequences for them will be job loss. And, you know, I think we need to be very clear that um, we've got good evidence that the vaccination is necessary to reduce the risk because my understanding is that mask wearing is effective to stop contagion. And while I appreciate that, you know, you know it shows that vaccination generally um, reduces the transmission, but it could be argued that mask wearing would do the job and it wouldn't have that severe consequence of a person losing their, you know, their employment. I mean, we're looking at, at close to 60 people that might be affected with WIPA. That's all, yeah. I appreciate, Gary, it's a difficult decision because I don't think we've got, real, you know, really um, not, not, I suppose, robust evidence. Yeah, there's indications, but, you know, um, it's a serious thing, yeah, for people to actually, um, yeah, lose their job. Yeah. So, so I, I agree with that, Claire. Our modelling wouldn't show that um, uh, 60 staff would be affected in that way it's something quite a bit less than that actually we've we have another survey out with the staff at the moment but look i agree um the prospect of a staff member losing a job is something you do lose sleep over so mm. so we'll do whatever we can to work with those people 
Yes, it's a divisive issue. Look, so thank you, Gary, for that, and and uh, Jenny for your your verbal briefing. Um, uh, obviously, uh, one thing that you've put through your report, which is really important, is that this is this is fast paced and moving. Um, you know, nationally, the numbers have looked good over the weekend, and I guess we're all waiting with bated breath to see what this week brings after, or perhaps it's by about next weekend after after. Uh, the traffic light system has been introduced. So um, I suspect uh, this won't be the last time we're talking COVID. And I know, Gary, more importantly, it's um, I've talked to a number of chief, uh, and perhaps it's the rest of, rest of the, the committee, I've talked to a number of chief executives on this around the country, and this is taking a lot of your time, Gary. Um, I'm conscious of that. Plus, as you've said, we are acknowledged with clear um, some uh, significant issues potenti potentially the staff as you go through your consultation process. All right, that seems a serious note, but I wonder if we could move then, please, to the second point you raised, Jenny, which was the appendix, all due was it might be about three, uh, which is the um, just the updated template for the policies. Uh, look down good to me, by the way. It's on page uh, 73 of 155. Any comments folk would like to make about this? Yes, clear. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Jenny, love your report. Yeah, I'm really happy with it. Um, I really like the way it's um, set out, and I certainly can't think of any improvements at the moment. The question I have is around the drinking water compliance, which is on page um, 71, the network zone and E. coli. Oh, what a, sorry, what a sec, Claire. Oh, sorry. sorry, I was just, um, we hadn't quite got to that report. We'll get there. You've got. Oh, sorry. Right, yeah. this thing I, I was just trying to follow Jenny's lead, which was the COVID verbal update, and then she referred us to Appendix Two, which was the the report for the policy the updated policies and compliance. I just wondered whether there's any any comment on that. Yes, Andrew. My only comment is I think it's genius. This is um, it's beautiful. It's simple. It's clear, and um, it's got all the important things that that we want to um, you know develop a culture in our, um, in our uh, community with our working community um, being the district council staff. So I'm, 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 I love it. Yep. Good. Thank you. Yes, Claire. Um, yeah, I, I think so too. There's been outstanding work done on the, on the wording of it. It's so easy to understand. I did, I did have a minor improvement to the wording um, for things to consider, uh, which is on the second page. Um, yep. Yeah, the, the, the fourth one, am I as familiar with the legislation as I need to be? That's all, but very minor. And I do love the way it's just so easy to understand. Well done, congratulations. Yep, no, uh, thank you for that, Claire and, uh, and Andrew. I think we would want to say it was uh, certainly going in the right direction. Um, and uh, um, it will be interesting to see the totality of the Potiaki, if I've got that right, um, um, initiative in place. Um, I think uh, any good council that I've seen is starting to try and integrate and bring these things together. And certainly the consistency of form and policy documents is really valuable. Jenny, can you take us through the quarterly report, please? So again, note the emerging risks. I think it's really important to understand that there's still a vacuum of information, particularly around community isolation and what that means, um, both for our normal staff and as going about business as usual, and as well for any um, regionally led initiatives, particularly in the welfare space, um, as well as the other emerging risks. And from this meeting, we're reporting on the risk mitigation actions, which are largely being taken from the business plans. Those um, exceptions that are in the table do not materially impact on risk levels, and the majority of actions are making good progress as planned. Um, and I invite any questions. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, and just before we start again, and Claire, you've got first, you've got right the first question. Um, um, I do really appreciate the way this is developing. I find this quite, you know, certainly as a person who is 
shall we say, occasional into Waipa. This is a very helpful snapshot. So um, I tout this around the country for what it's worth, Jenny. Claire, can you uh, ask your question now? I think <laughs> yeah. <some> <laughs> Thanks very <laughs> much. You, you know, and I help I. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's to do with that the sampling in the network zone for the water. Um, how can we get our reliability of sample improved, actually? Because we do get a really black mark against us, even if the, the result is shown to be um, a random one or you know, it doesn't reflect actual contamination. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but it still is a permanent um, slur against our, um, against our performance, that's all. So um, I'm interested to know whether or not there could be any improvement in the reliability of the sampling possible. Seen Dawn's picture, picture come up on the screen pretty fast. Well, I presume you're going to have a <laughs> an answer. Is that right? Yeah, kia ora, everyone. Absolutely. So, you know, equ equally, we're as concerned about such things, you know, because it, it is our reputation, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so the team brought a paper to exec that outlined all of the investigations that were undertaken, and there is some further work happening. So the sampling analysis team sit within our shed services, the, the Waikato Lass group, and... Um, and yeah, their, their, um, their investigations were, were, were very thorough in terms of this stuff. And there have been some learnings around the sampling point and some further um, sort of QA training and, and some of those things. Also noting that coming now under Tomata Arawai, um, mm. there are increased sort of competence, demonstration of ongoing competence. And I think that's again going to be beneficial that our, you know there are going to be these regular check-ins so we don't get complacency happening through these processes. So, so pretty confident that we're, we're on a path of improvement. But as, as you say, a, a bit of a, a disappointment that happened in the first place. Now, could I just ask you, Dawn, you know, with um, Traumata ROI, you know, like, have they, have they got a sort of a really good program around making sure that this, you know, the people that are doing the something, you know, like you're saying, demonstrating competence and things like that, like they're obviously see that as a focus area too. So are you quite happy with the approach that they're taking to ensure that um, everyone understands the expectations and maybe there's best practice to follow or stuff like, stuff like that, you know. Yeah, so, so what we're doing at the moment is doing a bit of a gap analysis in terms of the, the new water services bill that, that outlines all of these requirements in terms of just being very transparent about what it is we do now versus what Tomas Arawai will require. Um, mm. They're doing some work around approved solutions and things for rural water supplies and the like. Um, but, but yeah, at the moment, it's more around um, us understanding what that gap analysis is. Um, mm. But one of the first ones that we're, we're doing is, is our internal staff and, and you know, our, our, um, the Waikato last team um, that demonstration of competence is, is a pretty early one and getting you know just heard this morning all of our retook team are now fully signed up in terms of the apprenticeship scheme um, so so yeah we're, we're making some gains there but that gap analysis will be something we'll bring to elect members um, hopefully early next year cool thank you very much members any other questions for Jenny I um I did just wonder at a sort of a, a, a semi-academic level, Jenny, whether in fact, uh, while risk nine is failure to embed a health and safety culture, which is really important and it's stable, I would have thought in some way we need to acknowledge that that COVID, um, unless I'm missing one, COVID is actually affecting us as a whole. Actually, has a real impact on risk to our culture, actually, if it's divisive in the way potentially that it could be. And um, I, um, uh, I would just think that the stability of at least one or two of those measures may be incorrect in the current environment, incorrect an overstatement. But I, I think in the way, for instance, that you've raised it, Roger, um, and you've talked about it, Gary, that when we look at this, both the internal and external level of service delivery, the effect of COVID is raising the general risk environment for us in the organ. And, in the organisation, as I was very quickly trying to add on to as it is for the sector. Um, but I just don't think we've quite uh, um, nailed that present, that representation here, because I, um, I think it's a very active risk rather than necessarily even just emergent. Minor, minor in some sense, but important. Can you, one question for me um, was the higher velocity risk pathways. Um, so if I understand higher velocity, 
correctly, it's something which is acknowledged as a risk, but if it should suddenly come upon us, would really hit us. Can you just amplify or, or, or explain further information management community response? Why has that presumably got a higher velocity, say, to COVID or something like that? What is um, it? So I might take that one. So an example for information management would be uh, if we get a cyber attack. Um, it, it hits very fast and has impacts um, straight away. Um, so the higher velocity is really the, the time, I guess, that um, you know, it takes to have that high impact. And the community response, again, is around um, communicating a decision. Um, for example, COVID is one very quickly. There's a very rapid response and very quickly there's a risk realised there. So it's about the speed, the speed of the impact. Right, so we have, so, so I, that's what I took it to mean, actually, George. So what I'm just trying to work through is, is um, essentially then the cybersecurity risk update on the next page becomes really important to us, doesn't it? Because um, a bit like COVID with, a, with, a, um, uh, with, with, with a, some form of security breach, its velocity is really high because it's going to hit us hard uh, we're going to, you know, if it's malware or something, we're going to have to spend uh, some period of time trying to both recover, um, start up again, et cetera. So that places a lot of importance in around our cyber security risk. So how would you characterise this? I take it we're, we're on the whole, the way I've seen it, um, or I guess accepted it at YPA is we're reasonably comfortable that our general cyber security risk is is well managed at this stage. Am I correct in that impression? Um, yep, I will get Ken to comment um, on this as well. But but yes, um, my my summary is that WIPA is in a good space in regards to cyber security. Um, it's actively working on um, reducing the risk and putting mitigants in place. And there's quite a bit of evidence from what Richard is doing in regards to training, et cetera, um, and working um, across shared services that, that is making an impact on staff behavior. So there's an ongoing program of improvement um, and the assessment that is coming through on a quarterly basis would indicate that uh, WIPER is constantly improving. Thank you. Ken, got any comments? Uh, 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 yeah, so, so through the chair, just um, supporting what, um, yeah, what George has just said there, uh, has just said there, I mean, obviously, we, you know, cybersecurity is, is a thing that we would certainly not be resting on our, on our laurels on, um, because, um, yeah, you know, because obviously the impact of a cybersecurity event is, um, is um, absolutely incredible, um, as, um, you know, as we've seen in other organisations, um, you know, even, even within the Waikato. Um, but um, yeah, but as um, as George has just said, yeah, look, um, yeah, we've um, yeah, we we are we we are running a program in that um, in that space. Um, certainly a training program. Um, we're looking at a lot of um, of benchmark benchmarking statistics, and and we're performing well in those benchmark benchmarking statistics. Um, and, and actually, the other um, thing that was an indicator, and I, and I was quite interested in this. So um, yeah, so look, um, obviously, with the, the cybersecurity events happening throughout the world, um, the, um, the world of insurance in regard to, um, to, to cybersecurity liability is, is changing very, very quickly as well. And um, yeah, and um, yeah, WIPA and, and a number of other councils throughout, um, throughout New Zealand um, had to go through a, um, had to go through an insurance renewal process, um, obviously, um, f f first of November. Um, you, know, you know, we reported this to you, and and in that, um, in the um, in the renewal of the cyber um, this year, um, yeah, there was uh, there was quite a significant shift, um, but but by, by the insurers in, in regard to that insurance, um, in terms of actually who they were actually prepared um, to offer that insurance to, um, yeah, the, yeah, you know, that um, yeah, that they actually withdrew that insurance from from a number a number of entities. 
um, and also um, yeah, you know in terms of the, in terms of the premiums just to just to pick up on the risk and look um, look Wipar performed very very well in that space so um, yeah so 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 yeah insurance was um, offered to us um, pretty much on the same terms and conditions as previously um, a lot of um, a lot of other New Zealand councils um, actually um, did not get that um, that same result um, and in fact a lot of the councils even around us and in, in the Waikato and Bay of Plenty um, regions um, did, did not get that same result. Um, so, so you know, look, look, look um, as, I, as I said, this is certainly not something that you um, you rest on the laurels on. Um, but um, yeah, but I did find that a, a, a you know a, a very heartening um, indicator um, that um, then in terms of the insurance market, um, you, you know, who is very, very, very sensitive to the to the risk in that space, in, in terms of them being prepared to continue to to offer that cyber insurance to us. Um, yeah, I think I think um, yeah, yeah, you know is is of quite significant relevance. Thank you for that, Ken. Right, members, any other questions that we, you'd like to ask at this stage about uh, the quarterly risk report? Or are you going to all go into Christmas comforted, comforted that the risks are under control? That's a joke. <laughs> Andrew's got a thumbs up. That's good. Okay. Um, look, I would encourage, look, I know you have, I'd encourage, thank you for the rest of the report. I mean, it raises a whole bunch of other things which we could probably spend a lot of time on other than they look like the sorts of risks, Jenny, that I would be expecting the organisation to have a focus on things like a framework for managing threats and aggressive behaviour. Really, really um, glad to see comply with not necessarily because I want to endorse a product, but actually the approach to compliance um, uh, is, is being formalised through that process. Um, I've also taken a lot of encouragement when I looked again at that draft policy to see the links that you've got there to ProMap and actually presumably the activity that's going on underneath to be able to identify our systems of controls and effectively risk prevention. So, members, I would encourage you... Um, if to, to recognise that I think there is a lot of good work going on there. So unless there's any other question, I can't see anybody's hand up, um, uh, literal or figurative. Um, can I move to the recommendation then, please, on page 63, uh, which is that we receive uh, the report. And it's, thank you, Andrew, and it seems appropriate, Jenny and George, that we also recognise at this stage, at the end of the calendar year, your good efforts throughout the year for us, even if we go on the basis of the um, the Auditor General's uh, good report on us as well. So thank you. So look, I'll move that. Andrew, you second that. Can I put the motion, please? All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Those against? It's carried. Thank you very much. Right, if we could move to the uh, next item, please. Almost on time. That's not bad for me. Can we go to the internal report? A very interesting one. And I see we have Benita and Perry on board as well. Welcome to you too. It's nice to see you here. Um, but I wonder, um, Jenny, do you want do you want to lead off, or we hand this straight yep. over to Benita? I'll lead off. So we'll take the report as read. Um, the rating of good was very pleasing. We will work through what improvements we can make to strengthen the framework across the organisation as recommended and implement the future roadmap that KPMG have included as an appendum to the report. This will de be developed into a work programme which we'll bring it back to the committee. Um, and as part of this work, we'll be looking at project initiation with the, the community spatial plan and forming priorities for the next LTP. Mm. Um, and we're also aware that there was only one of the three projects looked at that, um, it's a very small sample to look at in terms of our nim nimbleness of procurement, but we're going to include that in scope for the follow-up procure to pay and contract management audit that's scheduled for next quarter. So I'd like to hand over to Perry and Benita now for key insights and any comments, and then we can take questions. Thanks, Jenny. Welcome again, Benita and Perry. I'll leave it in your hands to give us a quick put through the report, please. Thank you, Chair. And Maureen, everybody. Um, so in front of you is the internal audit report for uh, project management that we have uh, undertaken in the last quarter. Uh, the objective of this uh, internal audit was to look at the effectiveness of uh, council's processes, 
um, tools, uh, guidance material, policies, um, and, and the governance frameworks that are in place uh, that enable and assist in the execution of projects. We haven't uh, uh, provided deep dive you know, assurance on individual projects, okay. although in reviewing the, the policy and framework execution, we have um, sampled a few projects to see how those uh, frameworks and policies were actually put um, to practice. And I absolutely echo um, Jenny's uh, comments. It, it is a really uh, pleasing result, um, a, a good result for a project management um, internal audit in the uh, public sector, local government is, is a really good result. Um, as you can appreciate, we do quite a few of these reviews um, and it is you know, one of those areas that um, typically is quite challenging for organizations to, to get a handle on. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, the, the review has come out, um, uh, the results have come out really strong, as you can see. I have got Perry Woolley, who's a director in our team, and he specializes in project management. And I have to tell you that he is a really tough marker. Um, and, and, you know, you don't necessarily get um, to get, uh, you know, um, off easy with, with Perry. But if Perry's marked um, Wiper, you know, overall a uh, good um, rating, then I'd and I'd say that that is, um, you know, that that is um, a kudos to to management and the team that have put in all the hard work and mahi in getting the um, getting to this result. So without you know taking the thunder from Perry, I might just invite him to to give a few insights, um, if that's okay, Bruce. No, that's the welcome. Thank you, Benita. Thank you and welcome, Perry. Look forward to your your comments, mate. Uh, yes, thank you. And morning all. Um, so as Benita says, um, I don't give a good grade lightly. And and this is uh, with the context of quite a lot of work actually in the Waikato and other local authorities. Um, so, so yes, kudos to you guys, because I guess in summary, um, I thought that the um, project management uh, policy and framework that you guys have uh, is consistent with good practice. Um, and that it has allowed the council to propagate um, expectations and standards for project management for the organization in a way that was actually very pleasing to see um, for the scale of WIPA. Um, I'll just skip briefly then through some of the executive summary points just to try and convey some texture to those. Um, uh, the, and, and one interesting point, and I discussed this with some of the um, stakeholders, um, the policy makes the framework mandatory for all council projects. Um, and what I found quite interesting is in the detail in some of the projects, um, compliance in the sense of being literally um, uh, reflecting the standard in detail. Um, compliance varied, but uh, to be clear, I'm taking the view that that is not necessarily a bad thing, that it actually reflects um, some project managers taking the framework but extending it in, in, in cases where it's necessary to build out from the framework. Um, and I think that's a really mature and good sign to see. But it does then raise the subsequent question of how the framework and the policy indeed are gonna be taken forward as living uh, documents in a sense in council to enshrine the kind of continuous improvement that I did see uh, going on in, in the project sample and continue then to leverage those improvements across um, the whole of the council. Um, and to that extent, um, I know that when the framework was originally implemented, there was a, a kind of a body that would own the framework, but that seems to have lapsed somewhat in discussions I had, people were not clear who in the organization actually owns the framework in the sense on the one hand of managing compliance with it, but on the other hand also of, of taking it forward as a, as a living document. Um, so that said, when I dived into the monitoring um, of projects, um, it's clear that there is effective project governance in place, uh, essentially in the two, um, I came to think of them as centers of expertise of project management. Um, 
but project delivery and business improvement, there, there is um, governance across the projects uh, apparent in both of those domains, which is where the projects are sampled lived. Um, again, the, 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 the governance is, is certainly adequate um, and it's, it's different in the way that it applies in those two domains. And I think that is appropriate. Um, but I also got some anecdotal feedback that outside of those domains, um, and if I, if I had looked across the totality of the council, it's quite likely that um, there are other parts of the organization where the framework is not being used um, to the extent that it is within those two centers of excellence. So it seems to me that one of the fairly obvious um, recommendations is that uh, along with identifying the ownership of the framework and therefore the governance of it and, and the responsibility for monitoring compliance against the framework, um, one of the first steps would be to make sure that the framework is, is actually leveraged across the whole of the organization. Um, as I say, not necessarily for consistency, but just to make sure that you are availing yourselves of the good practice in the framework across the whole organization. Um, and then in detail, um, there is genuinely good use of templates in the framework to drive some commonality, but there are some areas where I think a little more should be done. And I'm specifically calling out their um, financial management and budgeting. Um, but again, as an aside, uh, one of the projects actually had really good um, financial management uh, techniques, which I offered up in the review as, as, as an example of something that could usefully be leveraged back into the framework. So I guess I'm reflecting again this point that there is some internal good practice already apparent that arguably just needs to get reflected back in the actual core framework documentation. Um, health and safety also was conspicuous by its absence and probably should be incorporated in the framework. Um, and resource management is really interesting for me because if I were to call out something in, particularly in local government that I see, um, and again, practices varied here in detail in the projects that I sampled. Um, but a very typical situation is that people actually do not account for resource costs, uh, internal resource costs in projects. And that is not good practice from a project management point of view. And also I, I have seen a number of cases in local government where that leads to um, essentially project portfolios being um, underperforming just because of, of staff being um, over committed to projects as well as um, their substantive roles mm -hmm. in council. So I guess here I'm calling out the need to improve that point also, both from a project management perspective, but also I would suggest for um, the ability to actually manage resources um, well across the whole organization and not lead to um, systemic kind of overcommitment of resources. Um, but, but as I say, I don't want to take anything away from the summary observation. Um, these are points of detail from my perspective. And um, overall, I thought the framework was being used, uh, was very competent and was being used very well, um, so far as I could see. Um, and th there's then just one final point from me, which is arguably a little outside of the scope of my review, but it was um, it was very interesting for me in discussions with, uh, again, some of the stakeholders, and I, I put this in, a in an appendix to the report, um, because essentially my feedback was actually, I think you guys are doing really well. Um, so the challenge for me, and I think for you guys is to is to see where to take the framework next and how to take it to the next level. And um, those discussions were very interesting and very encouraging for me to see that you guys are already thinking ahead of the, the curve here. Um, and what I put in the appendix are just some ideas about how to take what is already in the framework as um, a project management technique called benefits realization where um, you build into the project manager's ambit the need to, to measure the project at completion against the benefits that were envisaged for it. 
And again, the really encouraging thing is that in all three of the projects I sampled, this was being done diligently, um, which is, is frankly very unusual, um, not just in government, but in, in organizations generally. Um, people acknowledge that benefits realization should be considered, but often really don't do it justice. Um, and the only thing that I would improve on in what I saw was, and again, it's very typical, but I think you guys, as many organizations do, in, in trying to do benefits realization, um, are struggling a little with actually quantifying benefits in the business case, mm. in order then to be able to demonstrate that the projects have delivered those benefits in a, um, in a quantifiable way post implementation. So what I set out in the appendix is, and it really is best practice as opposed to just good practice, but organizations and research demonstrates tremendously strong correlation between project results and the organizations that do benefits management well. And benefits management um, distinguishes from benefits realization as being something that kind of sits in the project management um, toolkit but persists through the project life cycle rather than just at the end and it it takes as its starting points the understanding that actually um, the big step forward here is to is to really do a good job of the benefits definition in project business cases because then um, the benefits of that flow downstream through the whole project execution and they serve as the kind of like the North Star for the project as it goes through its, its, um, its life cycle, as well as then making it relatively straightforward to demonstrate that the project has delivered against those objectives um, at the conclusion. So um, that's really the genesis of that appendix there. Uh, as I say, I, if you guys were to take that forward, I think you really would be embodying um, best practice in project management. But I, I believe in it passionately myself because it delivers such good outcomes. And um, I suggested it only because you guys were doing well at the basics, if you will, and also already doing a good job of addressing the benefits uh, realization as part of the project lifecycle. Um, I should probably stop there and uh, take questions. Thank you, Perry. That's um, very insightful, and I'm glad you're here to give us, um, I guess, the personalization of those those sorts of, it's not a good but, I hear your point, you're actually saying this is good, and actually yes, here go some things that actually would uh, enhance what you're doing. So um, I appreciate that and, uh, and what you've said, Benita, as well. So I've got to open it up to questions for, for members at this stage. Any questions folk would like to ask? I wonder if uh, either Dawn or Gary, um, or gee, even Peter, I see you're there, Peter. Um, you folk are at the heart of some of this stuff. Is there anything that you'd like to comment from a management perspective? I'd be open to uh, some comments briefly. No? Okay. Can I ask a question? Who owns it? Happy to make a, a comment. <laughs> <laughs> I've got questions, Gary. So <laughs> I'll let you kill it first. <laughs> well, well, just first, I just wanted to uh, thank. Uh, Perry, I think for those of us who are lucky enough to talk to Perry, we all learned a lot and really appreciate that. Um, when I was uh, reflecting on the audit and had a chat with uh, some of the team, and I noticed Peter's here, it's, it's great to have a really good framework, but the big risk that we have right at the moment is, of course, um, keeping hold of the, the great people that we've got that have been implementing this framework um, and of course the better you get the more your staff get targeted um, and, and the harder it is to keep them and so just reminded that we've actually lost six really good players in this field from WIPA um, I think since Peter's been here so, so the, the, there is a, a real um, dearth of, of really good practitioners in this space and something we're going to have to work very hard at managing very interesting point. Peter and Dawn, is there anything that you folk would like to, to say at this stage? No? Brilliant. Yes, Ken. 
Yeah, and um, so, so so look, Bruce, I'll, I'll take you up on the offer for um for, for, for a comment here. So um look, look um, both Dawn and myself with the with the co-sponsors of this um project, um because as um as Perry pointed out, um yeah we've um kind of got two um two centres of excellence in in this space and and, and the organisation. So 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 obviously um Peter with Peter working with the um the major capital projects um delivery, um but but also George and her team um yeah working in the space of some of those um. Some of those cultural type um, type improvements, um, particularly um, yeah, you know, digital improvement. Uh, sorry, digital roadmap rollout, etc., um, which is uh, which is very much focused on culture and efficiency within the organisation, as well as meeting the expectations of customers, etc. So look, um, yeah, so, so I guess my um, my um, take out of this, um, yeah, so really um, really super pleased with the um, yeah with the the outcome of the um, of the review and um, yeah the um, the the very um, positive um, yeah conclusion. That um, that Perry has made, um, but 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 also um, yeah, recognizing that there are significant um, significant opportunities for improvement. Um, so um, yeah, so Perry have certainly um, and Benita have um, have certainly um, you know you know taken note of um, of those um, those improvements that do come through in, in Perry's commentary. Um, so so things things like um, like the the ownership of the um, yeah, yeah, you know of the of this whole space. Um, yeah, you know that is something that we we definitely will have to um, have to have a really good look at um, and in terms of um, yeah yeah in terms of that, that appendix um, that, that you've just spoken at, um, at quite considerable length about um, yeah there's certainly some significant um, opportunities there in terms of that even that very initial um, project identification and, and prioritization um, yeah you know and, and you've talked at length as well about that um, that benefit um, realization approach um, yeah you know, you know it's things like that that we'll have a really good look at um, and as the report um, says um, come back to this um, Committee in the in the new year, um, with a um, yeah, with an, an improvement plan, if you like, um, yeah, you know, picking up on those um, on those um, yeah, those improvement areas that the KPMG report provides. Brilliant, Andrew, you've got a question. More a comment, really. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just from an elected member's point of view, I take great comfort in this report, um, and if I understood the gist of what Perry was saying accurately, I guess um, the area we could be looking at, because we are now doing, I suppose you could say the basics well, is just um, a better understanding and focus on, on the prize that we are after with the delivery of, of, of projects. Um, mm. And yep, always enhances the result when you know exactly what you're um, what you're chasing. So, yeah, thanks very much. Appreciate the report. Thank you, Andrew. Just one of the other, look, again, very clear, but but other than one area, I just was interested in the, the idea of a mandatory um, policy framework, but, but um, uh, um, Perry, you've indicated that uh, um, people have taken it as the framework and set it up and out, which is good. Um, uh, I'm not fixated on mandatory, but I'm wondering, given we've identified two oh. specific areas of excellence, are there significant projects which are not subject to coming under these centres of excellence and are being undertaken? Perhaps that's not a question for you, Perry. It might, it might be for, for other folk. Through the chair, if I might answer on that one, I, I think there are projects within the organisation which have just sort of emerged organically, um, almost from a BAU, and um, and I think that, that that's something we've got to constantly sort of keep to the forefront of our mind, because we get such benefits of, of running it through this framework. That, that actually sometimes we do need to take that step back and go, well, well, actually, you know, this isn't BAU, it is a project and should be run through our project management framework. And I'll put my hand up that, that our carbon monitoring um, and reduction program is, is one such example of that, where it sort of, it just started to emerge. It, we, we were doing really good work, but we didn't have that formal framework. So we're taking that step back now and doing that. So, so there's an example, I think, of, of sort of that recognition and, and we just need to keep that awareness. Mm. Look, thank you for that, Dawn. I, I've, it's interesting. I, I partly, I probably fixated a wee bit on this with the report, Perry, mainly because of my work elsewhere. Um, I had 
I had some direct examples, not WIPAR related, of exact. I think it was exactly what you're saying, Dawn, of, of good act, good act, good activity. Probably have reasonable project control around it, um, but it just wasn't part of the system. And and some of the issues that come sometimes with that. So look, I, I leave it at that. I appreciate there's an action plan to come back, Ken, um, and the, these sorts of matters can be can be picked up. So look, I think that's a, that's a very useful report. I must confess, Bonita, I was looking at this from a reviewer's perspective, and when you put good on something, as in contrast to improving or needs improvement, um, uh, you feel you, you feel a bit of a risk that actually your client might let you down. So um, on your behalf, I'm going to say to Wipa, keep up the good work, <laughs> and don't let Perry and Bonita down on on terms of their good assessment, because I think it's something that. Um, we can we can hold up and say well done to everybody, um, uh, uh, and it's a great result and tremendous to have. Hey, can I um, just move to the recommendation, which is that we receive the report? And again, Benita Perry, thanks to you and uh, Perry for your feedback. I want to just acknowledge um, the thoroughness with which you've analysed this and the clarity with which you've fed back to us on behalf of yourself and Benita. Very grateful. So look, I'll move that motion, please. Can I have a seconder? Thank you, Claire. I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Those against? It's carried. Benita Perry, thank you very much. I think that's uh, for your time this morning. Um, as I think I've already acknowledged elsewhere, um, last, last meeting for the year. So we want to just appreciate or we'll express our appreciation for the work that KP have done for us over the course of the year. And uh, we wish you well for um, a restful break, uh, COVID free even, even more so, I suspect. So um, have a good day and thank you for your time with us this morning. Appreciate that. Thanks, Chair. And, and same from us. Uh, really appreciate all the time and assistance we've had the whole year. And wish you all a happy festive season as well and a safe one. Thank Lovely. you, Peter. Thank you, thank Perry. You. Appreciate your time, guys. Right, if we can move then, please, to the annual report. This is a, this is an item that Ken and I have been looking forward to, I think. <laughs> <laughs> G'day, Yolanda, how are you? I think you're the hard yards worker, so we should really start by saying thanks. I don't think I really had a chance on the 30th when really it was a matter of process and getting through to a council meeting, but uh, um, well done. And look, let's hear very quickly from your report, please. Oh, Yolanda, you need to put your microphone on, please. I don't think you, uh, you must be on mute, I think. No, no, no luck yet. No, that's not no, working. Still not. Yeah, so, so it is unusual, um, Yolanda, it's not showing as muted, but um, yeah, there must be, it must obviously be a technology issue because we certainly can't hear you at all. Uh, oh, I think you've started to come through now. now. Yeah. I think we can hear you now, Yolanda, just say something. Oh, there you oh. go. <laughs> Oh, oh good to know. Oh, Brilliant. <laughs> apologies to you. Good morning, committee members. Um, so this is just a report to basically indicate to you that we haven't received the annual, uh, the management letter points from the auditors yet. So with the annual report process only being completed last week, they're still finalizing their report. And that report would also include the previous findings that we received. So from management perspective, we've cleared all but one. Um, we're waiting for audit confirmation. So this is just to let the committee know that we'll be reporting on the full management letter then at the March meeting. Appreciate that. I think for the benefit of the meeting um, uh, members, unless you've got questions, I think we can take this as a genuine information report. Totally understand uh, uh, the situation from your perspective, Yolanda. Um, I do recognise that at the last meeting, we all breathed a collective sigh of relief that, um, that you folk had felt like we only had one item left open, um, subject to Leon and his team clearing those. And um, as they're good auditors, they'll always have recommendations, I know, but I'm sure we can deal with those in March. 
Um, uh, and look, I seriously, and I know Ken um, that you and Yolanda will, if there was anything urgent that 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 came up in um, uh, Leon's report with a draft or final, uh, you would deal with it anyway. Um, I'm sure by the time it got to March. Um, so look, thank you for that again. Thank you, uh, Yolanda. I don't members of the committee. Are there any questions you want to ask this report? There being none, look, I'd like to move then that we. Um, uh, uh, we receive Yolanda's report on the annual report and audit update, noting that the key finding okay. come later. Thank you. Well, I'm going to take two hands. So Andrew's moved it and, and Roger's seconded. Well done. I'll put Thank the you. motion in, please. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Those against? It's carried. Thank you very much, Yolanda. That's, that's wonderful. Can we move to the work plan? Um, I'm not going to say Ken, but do, do you look after this for us, Jenny, do you? I'm not quite certain who does. <laughs> yeah. oh, hey, hey, look, happy for, happy for Jenny to take the lead on this. She, um, she certainly wrote the, wrote the paper. So, yeah. Yes, take the credit, Jenny. Let's hear from you, please. Um, I'll take the report as read. And as you'll see, it follows a similar approach to last year's, well, to this year's plan. Um, there has been one site change due to the logistics. We're moving the payroll audit, um, in, which is a follow-up audit, into quarter four, and I'll update the document um, after this. And also just note that the new deep dive process is included as agreed at the last meeting and invite any questions. Folk, are there any questions you'd, you'd like to ask? Perhaps as, oh, clear. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, I'm really happy with the program. It's pretty full and I think our agendas are always, um, you know, really effective and, and well planned. Um, I have a question about the place for emissions reduction and climate change responses, um, changes in strategy or policy, things like that. That's going to be a consequence, particularly of the government's um, legislative changes or you know programs that they have made commitments to, like for instance the COP twenty six and things like that. Is um, is, there, is is it implicit in the program itself, Jenny, or um, don't you feel it's something that the audit and risk committee need to be sort of looking into in the you know in a formal way? Oh. There will be um, a top risk discussion around climate change. So that's how we're picking it up because yeah. it is one of our top risks. My, my presumption would be clear that there is some other part of governance that is actually dealing with the policy and, and strategy part of climate change. Uh, I would have thought our primary role was to see that um, the risk was acknowledged and that we had appropriate mitigations in place. Would you see it differently? Is it George? I thought you said um, George. I, oh, did I say George? I mean, you, Claire. Sorry, my mistake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry about that. If I said yeah, George, sorry to you as well. Um, well, I, I recently did an emissions workshop like last week and it's clear that there are quite significant changes coming, um, whether it's reporting, uh, like there's um, a task force for climate-related financial disclosures is yes. signalling that there's going to be some big um, changes to the way people like councils have to report, and that in itself may drive other change. Um, because we're getting a clearer idea of um, where we're going to get our renewable energy sources from, that in itself might um, have implications for the district, particularly around biomass and, um, yeah, I suppose the use of forestry and, and things like that. So they're quite strategic risks, I guess. Um, and I do think there's an expectation in the community that councils are seen to be leaders in the space as well. So I wouldn't like to, us to be seen to be not well prepared to report on what we're doing and, and, and how we're managing and we're we across the risks and all that kind of thing. So uh, that's why I, I, I sort of a gut feel that it should be something that, that's on the Audit and Risk Committee's work plan, but I'm open to how it's, how it's dealt with. It may well be that just having it in uh, the mix when we do our, our top 10 risk workshop or something, I don't know, but... Um, that's why I'm asked the question, I guess. Yeah. No, no, and good question. Uh, Ken. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so, so so through the chair and in response to your um your question, Claire. Um, so um yeah, so so as Jenny said, um yeah, we we do we do have these um deep dives into the top risks, and um and as um as things um actually happen, um yeah, um this is risk number ten, and it is actually scheduled for our next meeting in March. Um, so um yeah, so perhaps with the chair's and, and indulgence, um we, we we will obviously cover this in March as the, as the program um, provides. For um, and and look, maybe that's um, the time to um, after after we've done that deep dive on on risk number ten, um, maybe that's the time to decide if um, yeah, yeah you know if the if, if this um, if this committee um, yeah you know wants to wants to um, yeah you know have some more regular insight into what's happening in that space or, or whether it's appropriate just to um, kind of pick it up on a on a once a year basis um, yeah yeah you know that that could well be a discussion I think we we have in our deep dive. In, in March next year. Oh, okay. Yeah, cool. so, sorry, just through the chair too, just to um, add to that is, um, I mean, there's obviously a lot of work happening across council that is either directly or indirectly related to climate change, um, being potentially reported through other committees as well. Yeah. So maybe it's a chance at that deep dive just to outline what is being reported um, through which channels. Look, I, that's, perhaps that's what I was trying to hint at, George, was that I, I made, I, I would hope that there is a more a holistic council drive around um, uh, around climate change, and it's not just the and that's really what I was trying to get to clear not just the preserve of the audit and risk committee, mm -hmm. um, but I do actually think there is a very valid role for the audit and risk committee to um, check that risks are being mitigated. Look for what it's worth. Um, totally, um, um, I'm always a big big borrower and stealer. Um, I was just involved in a workshop on climate change at Far North District Council, um, and there are open agenda papers for the meeting last week, 25th of 24th, 25th of November, were very valuable. I found as a as a participant in a risk committee in the way in which they they broke climate change down to four significant contributing risks, and clear quite quite not unnaturally picked up most of the issues that I can think of that you raised has been um, of good concern. So look, I'll pass it on what it's worth. Just mm -hmm. as I'm always prepared to pass on YPAR's good good work, um, I'll pass on others as well. So um, it may be, I'm sure when you look at it, it's very, uh, it's very, if you were to choose to look at it, it was very familiar, except for the fourth risk, which is really good, which is failure to take the opportunities that climate change provide. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a very, um, a very good risk to uh, include in our risk register, which is what we've got at Far North District Council now. So um, uh, looking at actually the, the upside to climate change, not just the important, the very real and important needs of the, the, the obvious downside risks to climate change. So we'll leave it on. So look, we've got that in our program and, and clear. I, I agree with Ken and George. We picked this up as part of the deep dive and clearly part of that program. We work through um, how our committee fits within that uh, within that in terms of the, the totality of the council's effort. Any other comments that folk would like to make? I think Ken um, and Jenny, this is a, a, a good framework. Again, it served us reasonably well. And I think I feel comfortable reflecting back on both the financial year and the calendar year, it served us pretty well. Um, so um, I'd like to suggest that we keep it there and as we will, we'll review it from meeting to meeting to make certain that it's still current for us. Can I move to the recommendation please on page or recommendations on page 101 that we receive it and uh, that the proposed uh, audit and risk work plan um, and I don't think we've got any amendments, so we can get rid of that. Um, be approved um, as the Audit and Risk Committee 2022 work plan. Thank you, Andrew. Do I, and thank you, Claire. I doesn't, we've got two people anyway. I'll let, I'll let governance work out who proposed and who seconded. Can I put the motion, please? All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Those, those against? It's carried. Can I just ask one question, um, Ken? Um, uh, do full council see our full papers? Because I would be very keen for them to see this work program um, so that they understand what their committee is actually doing. Is that, would, would that they get to see the whole work program? Uh, 
Uh, so, um, yeah, so in, in response to that, yeah, um, that we don't actually give them the entire um, papers of the Order and Risk Committee, um, but um, at the next um, council meeting, after every meeting, um, yeah, we do we do um, provide a written report, and we do, um, yeah, we do provide them with the um, yeah with the items of um, of most significant interest, and and already we yes we have absolutely identified this work plan as one of those um, one of those items that will go through. To, um, through to the committee, so um, sorry, sorry, not to the committee, through to the um, through to the whole council. So they, yeah, so they receive the open minutes. Um, they receive they receive a cover report. They receive the open minutes and the uh, number of the items. Um, so yeah, this one will definitely be going through. And in fact, actually, we will actually invite um, the council's comment on this work plan. Um, yeah, they would they will they will definitely see that as as well as two or three of the other. Um, appendix um, papers um, on the on the agenda today. Brilliant. No, it's good. I just want, perhaps I'm just wanting to make certain that they don't think we're just sitting around doing nothing. So um, I, <laughs> that's a very damn negative way of looking at it. But I think this is just a good communication tool in an area that, uh, let's go back to the item we had with Andrea and Nicole um, that you sponsored, Roger, which was that, you know, understanding is difficult sometimes in this area. So at least when we get a even if it's a, 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 a table with dots, they get a sense of potentially the topics we're covering. I think that's good. Thank you for that. Right. I agree with that. Um, now, this is, I said to Ken when we were going through the agenda, this is, I found this a very encouraging paper, the risk reporting on the Wai Park Community Spatial Plan Project. Um, and uh, um, so, yes, can, can I have whoever's going to speak to this one, please? I'd be very interested to... Ken. Yeah, um, so, so, so look, Bruce, um, I, I, um, I will not be speaking to this, um, but oh, look, I, I, did, I did just want to um, to convey to the meeting, um, look, this item was meant to be co-presented by um, by both um, Kirsty, um, our, our strategic man manager, as well as um, Vanessa, who you can um, who you can see on on screen. Um, Vanessa is um, is a consultant who's um, yeah who's working very very closely with us in this space. Um, yeah, unfortunately, um, yeah, um, I've, yeah, I've just been advised in the last few minutes that, that Kirsty's held up on, on another engagement. Um, so, um, yeah, but, um, yeah, we're in Vanessa's very, very capable hands in, ter in terms of um, presenting this item this morning. Welcome, uh, Vanessa. Apologies, I hadn't realised you were external. So welcome to our meeting. No. So, um, so uh, thank you for the introduction, Ken. I used to be external and the... Uh, the <laughs> The gorgeousness of your organization actually brought me in about three or four months ago. So I am an internal oh, staff. Oh, right. Uh, oh, since okay. um, <laughs> August, I haven't actually um, gone through the, the office yet because we have been we have been in different alert levels since. But um, yeah. I'm very much internal staff and from the YPA District Council fan now. I, I, I look, Bruce. Um, so through Bruce, look, can I offer my sincere <laughs> Um, no, I, I, guess, I guess I guess that is a sign of our COVID disrupted times mm. <laughs> that um, yeah we, we're just not um, engaging quite as well as we have in the, in the past. Yeah, but um, yes, s sincerely apologise for this. It was it was a very good introduction otherwise. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, yes, as 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 Ken uh, just mentioned, Kirsty has been actually holed up, um, so I will be actually uh, uh, providing an update um, and present the report. Um, through this this committee, this is my my first audit and risk committee uh, presentation. So so uh, bear with me. Um, so this uh, uh, so the, for the ones who actually haven't uh, introduced, I'm just introducing myself first. Um, I'm um, a senior strategic planner at Waipa District Council, um, and I am the project manager and co technical lead for the the Waipa Committee Spatial Plan. Um, so I will take this report um, as read, um, and as you could see from uh, item one on the executive summary, the purpose of this report is to provide uh, a brief overview um, on uh, progress and on the project uh, on itself. Um, it is three parts, um, also to outline um, the risk identification, risk assessment, risk mitigation and management um, process uh, uh, to date, and to also look at covering the, the following steps uh, when it comes to um, the next uh, uh, report to the audit and risk committee. 
So on this first point, um, it provides the, the, an outline on the, the purpose and needs um, for uh, the WIPA Committee Spatial Plan and uh, how it actually fits within the wider strategic framework and within the Council. It also provides um, a bit of a background uh, on the development of the project uh, to date, um, giving some guidance on the, the, the four different work streams um, and uh, the, the, the different uh, um, work which is currently undertaken. Um, most of you would be conversant with the, the project, um, but that, I think that's a, a good time for if there is any additional question to uh, that background item within the report. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, look, for me, it's first time reading it, but I yeah. think I've got a pretty strong sense of where you're going. It always interests me um, uh, in terms of our committee, with our limited time, this must be one of high strategic importance. Uh, I know that sounds like I'm trying to give the committee high value as well. Uh, I am to some extent, but this clearly is pivotal, and this is really me asking a question, this is pivotal to, to the work and, and the future planning for council, correct? Indeed, indeed. And it aligns with um, some of the RMA reform um, coming up as well. So that's really why by taking a step forward to, um, to understand how um, all the different um, infrastructure from a community or investment perspective will actually work together over the next 30 to 50 years. Um, so that's actually a, a good point to, to this. I think it's been quite recognized that this um, this project is complex, um, is uh, first of its kind for the, the, the district, um, for council, um, and is, is quite then dynamic. So having this risk assessment approach is, is paramount um, to, the, to the, the well delivery of this project. Mm. Um, Sorry, I had a, look, I had a question to Vanessa, Roger. Yes, thank you, through you. Uh, and it's more of a comment than uh, a question. Uh, thanks, Vanessa, um, for that. But just to acknowledge that the update in the Friday uh, news that comes out uh, each week does keep us well informed as to the progress of this work. And that really is appreciated because um, certainly it is going to be possibly the critical document for the next 30 years. So, uh, yes, I'm sure that I speak from the other um, EMs that uh, we are kept well up with the progress. So thank you, Hona. Fantastic. You. Yeah, that's that's a very good feedback. And and uh, as I said, we, we, we're really open to this com conversation and we have tried to, to ensure that elected members and partners are uh, uh, um, okay. taken on this journey towards developing the, the community spatial plan. And, sorry, Vanessa, again, I see Andrew's hand up. Andrew? Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Uh, I guess just harking back to the, our internal audit, um, does does this project come in under our uh, project management framework that um, that uh, you know was was being discussed earlier? Um, because I totally agree with uh, Roger. This is this is absolutely critical in becoming a truly strategic led um, organisation. And uh, yeah, so wonder whether we might they might be stealing thunder from actually our risk management process. But um, I do wonder if we could just that's a good question. Are we doing this with the right project disciplines? That doesn't sound a bit negative, Vanessa. I don't mean it that way, but it's just more about being positive and ensuring we do deliver. This has got our this has got the WIPA project management approach attached to it. Jenny, I wonder whether it might be something given you are going to come up with the risk stuff, whether you could give us some idea of, please. Um I don't know that it's been formally aligned with the framework just because of the dynamic nature of the project, but certainly the governance is in place, the risk management is in place and using the um, standard artefacts and the project, the disciplines around meetings and all those sorts of things are ongoing and regular progress reportings. There's a lot of reporting through to council, not just in the Friday mail out, but verbal and other updates 
um, and reports. And the focus of this session is really just to nail in on the risks in, in the, in the, so we've had an identification um, workshop and a, the project team has worked through analysing and assessing those risks and coming up with the mitigation. So I'm comfortable that the right disciplines are being applied. Um, and it is something that we can look at and make certain it is aligned to the framework. But it is one of those ones where the framework's got to flex a bit. It's quite different to putting pipes in ground mm. or even software changes, you know, because it is strategic and it's very dynamic and the, there certainly is active stakeholder management going on as well. They aren't unfamiliar terms with project management, by the way, Jenny. So <laughs> I, I think Andrew, I am a project I, manager in an earlier life. That's right. I, I think I think Andrew's comment is a really good one, but I've heard you say you'll also check. Gary, your hands up. So this was one of those projects I talked to Perry about when when we were thinking about um, putting other projects within a wider context. And this is one where we talked about uh, the need to flex as it continues to develop. Yeah. So so we have the governance, reporting, risk management, all of that stuff in there, but it is one of those projects where we are flexing to make it work. Hmm. Which is good. And, and, and I mean, um, Vanessa, this doesn't directly worry you, but it also then reflects actually how we build the PMO um, policy guidance and, and approach, isn't it? Which is that actually has a learning culture. How do we, how do we learn what comes out of this? Because you'll get the spatial plan done. There'll be another one of these sort of unique dynamic um, whatever projects um, uh, working, but anyway, the point made. Anyway, th very thank you for that, Andrew. It's it's great. So appreciate that. Any other questions at this stage for Nessa, or will we get on to the the next phase, particularly around the, the project and risk management? Thanks, Vanessa. Appreciate it. it. If you've got some more points, love to hear them, please. Yeah. Yes, um, so that actually flows well. So I, I was going to give a, a bit of a background to um, the build-up to that, that risk register. So we initially had uh, done uh, um, developed um, a risk register during phase one um, of a project to understand a little bit more about how those work stream would work together and what potential risks we could actually incur um, in delivering um, this project. But as I said, with uh, in view of the complexity and dynamism of, of this of this project, um, we we uh, you know we, we came to the fact that but needed to have a bit more of a robust uh, um, framework and align actually with organizational uh, templates and requirements. Um, we therefore uh, had a, a workshop um, including project control, the project control groups, as some of the elected members here uh, are, are part of, and the, the, the core project team on the 12th of November, with the assistance of, of Jenny as well, um, to have a frank discussion, open discussion about the potential risk that those, the, this uh, um, this project uh, could endure uh, a very valuable uh, session, very valuable uh, feedback um, and honest feedback. Again, um, the output of uh, this first workshop uh, were entered into uh, the risk assumption, action, issue and decision um, matrix, um, which guides us through the, the, the quantitative and qualitative uh, assessment of those risks. We were then uh, we were then uh, um, uh, attended a, a project team workshop where we uh, framed um, those risk uh, uh, statements um, and assessing the likelihood and consequences of each of those risks, um, and that actually supported us through the the, the, the qualitative assessment of uh, a risk potential level. Um, the matrix is still uh, uh, due to be finished and, and, uh, um, and will be uh, finalized and reviewed by the project team um, before uh, uh, the, the Christmas break, both, so before the, the 17th, 20th of December, I'm expecting. Um, and and um, this, this uh, final, Kind of uh, uh, matrix will outline the the very high risk, which 
will base um, the, 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 the reporting for uh, the quarterly reporting um, to this audit and risk um, committee. Um, so that is the, the, the expectation that our, our next report will outline uh, the identified high risk um, for the project. Thank you, Vanessa. That's, that's uh, incredibly helpful. Members, any questions for Vanessa or indeed for Jenny, who's, who's obviously riding shotgun on the project from a risk perspective at this stage? There isn't. That's great. Thank you. Um, Vanessa, I introduced this by saying this really encouraged me, this project, because um, um, I think you said it's more than pipes. Uh, and I know we've got Peter coming up on pipes and roads, um, but of course our organisation is so much more. And I was very appreciative that um, there has been recognition within uh, council that this is a this is a project of high strategic importance. I think it's the phrase very high um, uh, um, strategic importance, and that it's been in a sense offered up to the committee rather than us trying to find it. So um, that's really positive. It speaks highly uh, of the culture. And Vanessa, your comments give me comfort. Um, that we are trying to approach what is, I can see, a criti critical and um, uh, important project appropriately. So uh, I'm very grateful for your report. Are there other questions, folk, at this stage you'd like to ask, Vanessa? There being none, I think you're obviously pretty aware from the updates, et cetera, about where the actual project is going. So, Vanessa, it does mean we'll welcome you back um, as a member of the team uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, next March, I think, when we meet. So we'll be very interested to see um, uh, how the uh, the risk matrix turns out and, uh, and what you're managing. Do appreciate that. Thank you. Well, Thank you all. With that, can I just move to the recommendation on page 106? Uh, which is that the report titled Risk Reporting on the Waipa Community Spatial Plan Project be received with thanks to Vanessa. I'll move that. Thank you, Claire. Second, um, I'll put the motion in, please. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Those against? It's carried. Thank you very much. Yeah, Andrew, you got a uh, point? Yes, look, I'm just... Oh, you've gone mute on me, Andrew. Are you are you moving out for your, your call? Sorry. Sorry, yes, I yeah, I need okay. to go. So, yeah, but anyway, mate, well, we'll catch you back one o'clock if you if you're not back before twelve thirty, mate. Well, uh, we'll see you at one with a bit of luck. Thank you. Right, thank you for that, Vanessa. Appreciate that. Can we move then, please? To I think it's um, I forgot it right. Yes, Pete, capital program. I'm here. Yeah, welcome, Peter. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we just leapt forward a, a few pages, just caught me unawares. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, you're next on the list, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's all right. That's all right. Um, okay, so, yes, capital program uh, been prepared um, by our uh, financial analyst. And when I was on leave um, earlier this month, uh, but I'm here to deliver the report and hopefully answer any questions. Um, so we just detailed uh, the 171 projects, budgeted projects uh, with a total spend to date um, being more or less on target for uh, the reporting timeframe um, at the end of October, uh, which is a you know, third of the way through the year. And uh, so we're showing our, um, our expenditure there um, on the uh, against the, the cash flow forecast at least as being relatively on target with an actual of 34 million year to date and 20 million dollars of commitments at this stage. Um, so the the overall picture is that uh, that we have had um, some slowdown to the work program caused by uh, the COVID lockdown. Um, that came into effect on the 17th of August. Um, so that, that's created, uh, as I say, just a little bit of loss of momentum in terms of uh, getting our work program ostensibly out to market and through procurement hoops. But we're now at a stage where we've made up some ground and we've got a number of projects which uh, are now um, back on the the phases of the project that they need to be in and starting to track better. 
um, and we have uh, a number of um, capital projects uh, which are out um, in the marketplace and will be ready to be awarded and, and start within the construction season within the next few weeks. So that's, I guess, the positive news. The, um, the difference between uh, our cash flow forecast and the what was the, the current forecast uh, at the beginning of the financial year is still fairly significant with almost $75 million uh, looking to uh, for work to be essentially reprogrammed into probably year two, year two, year three of, of the long-term plan program. So that initial work has been done in terms of identifying uh, those projects and the, uh, the funding implications um, and potential, I guess, delays to those projects uh, going through uh, to finance. There'll be more work done on that reforecasting as, uh, as the financial year progresses as well. Of that uh, $75 million, um, Almost half of it is made up of uh, two particular projects associated with the C2 growth cell in Cambridge um, uh, and the development of 3Ms um, within that C2 growth cell. And that's the, uh, the build um, for the, the new roundabout on Cambridge Road associated with the um, C2, C3 growth cell and the uh, stormwater drainage and outfall um, to service uh, C2 as well. So they combine to be, uh, I think, just in excess of about $30 million worth of work. So that work program has now been identified, but it does mean that the, that, that capital spend um, will fall outside of this financial year and move into year two. Maybe I should just stop and see if there are any questions at this stage. Um, and, and, Thank you. And that's those. Let me just let me just check the numbers. The average account that I am, Pete. So, um, hundred. We 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 had in our long term plan, one hundred and sixty two million dollars capex, right? right? Our forecast um, now, as we see it at the moment, is one hundred and eight is what we will be able to deliver by thirty June next year. Correct. That's our current cash flow forecast. Yeah, That's correct. Okay. And the 183, which is the current forecast, which is above the LTP, mm -hmm. um, has been caused by what? Why, why did it go above the, um, you know, we were, we're only three months into the LTP cycle. How come we were, we, we are 20 million above uh, the year one forecast? So those were carry forwards um, okay. from okay. the previous year. Got gotcha, you, yeah. mate. So gotcha. we start off with the, the green bar. That's um, right. And the carry forwards. Got gotcha. you. Sorry, I knew yeah, I knew it was an easy answer. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all right. We yeah. um we there is a, a little kind of legend at the beginning of appendix one, um, just to try and um yeah. no, I get outline that. what each of those terms uh, means. But, but sorry, mate. Uh, it's helpful yeah. sometimes to put it in my own language to make certain I've got it right. Okay. So there we are. Thank you for that. Um Cleo, I can see your hand up. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Peter. I um, really appreciate you pointing out that the $70 million is is really riding on just two projects and they're both that affected by that C2, C3 growth bell in Cambridge. And I just want to acknowledge the difficulty that staff have faced in dealing with that with the developer. And I understand we're still not out of the woods yet either. Um, and that um, while it's good for the committee to be appraised of the different, you know, the, the, the progress, I think it doesn't really convey, you know, all of the efforts that are going on behind the scenes because of, you know, the, the changes that the developer has been wanting to see happen, you know, that haven't really been fitting in with what council would expect, you know, um, in terms of, you know, the, the, the usual evolution and, and, implementation of a project so it's good to know that it's really just those two projects that are sort of changing the the, the completion of this report and I yeah I just appreciate all the efforts that the staff are making for that particular developer. Yeah through you Mr Chair the yeah, I guess I was just um, signaling those the two uh, largest projects which influence that 75 million 
Um, there are other projects as well, but they are the two dominant projects in terms of the, the capital values involved. Um, so there are two out of about a line of uh, spreadsheet lines, 40 lines of uh, different projects in community services um, and infrastructure services and growth as well. So there are a number of things which, um, it, it, you know, inevitably, uh, for whatever reason, uh, need to change and be reprogrammed through, through the year. A lot of these projects are, are related to growth, however. Um, I mean, obviously the two large ones I've mentioned in, in C2 Cambridge, but uh, there are others as well in other parts of um, Cambridge and the district, which are growth related. And it's just very challenging um, in the current environment. Uh, well, it's always challenging with growth, but I think in the current environment with the effects of um, COVID-19 on all parts of the industry um, to, you know, to really make, uh, to lock these um, expenditure programs in that, uh, that they are quite fluid and we need to keep reforecasting and, and readjusting our sites in terms of when the money may actually be spent. Mm. I presume, Ken, this will have an impact on the balance sheet, obviously, and the level of debt that we'll have at 30 June as well. Uh, uh, yes, so um, yes, so through you, Chair, um, it certainly will, and in, in fact, we're um, we're we're right, and our heads are right in that at the moment. Um, obviously, in re in regard to the annual plan, um, and, and forming up the annual plan, and what our opening, um, what our opening deep position will be. Hmm. Roger, sorry, you put your hand up. I didn't see that, mate. No, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, Peter, it, it sounds and, and it looks as if everything's steaming ahead over here in Cambridge because you can see at the, uh, the Norfolk Victoria lights there, the two developments of uh, the Somerset Village and the A&E appear both to have started and uh, the first sod to have turned. Will that bring forward the... Um, the work to open up on the other side into uh, the C1 area and the development of that four-way intersection at those lights? Are we seeing that being brought forward because that work is, is commencing? It would seem logical to do it at a similar time. Yeah, um, so it, th there was expenditure in our budgets for that work. Um, and I guess it's making it clear when <clears throat> the time frame for that work will will come about. And you're right, there is uh, increased, um, I guess, urgency from development uh, in in the different quadrants of of that new intersection at the moment. Uh, but in terms of um, our council's capital budgets, um, it probably means uh, there will be potential further delays in expenditure beyond the current financial year. So a lot of that work was anticipated to be able to be done this year. Um, so there will need, be a need to, um, you know, use budget change forms to move expenditure into 22-23. Uh, so that's a roundabout way of saying we expected that that we would be incurring any expense in doing work. Um, and it is being delayed, but on the ground, as you're right, we're actually seeing progress and we're seeing that the time is soon coming for, for that um, physical work to need to be done. Good, thanks for that. So with the colorful circles, Peter, um, um, I think you've reflected that you said you've done some work to, to fill the gaps or get things back aligned probably for a third of the way through the year. Um, uh, um, the colours are probably in the white, the right quadrants, I think you, I think was what you were arguing. So um, uh, obviously I'm looking at the project tracking, most of them are on, on, on track. Um, uh, and indeed, if you go one above the project phase, I guess that's where I'm thinking they're in the logical Area, I think you're indicating growth is primarily uh, the projects at the moment that are the difference between the forecast and the budget. 
I just wonder if you could um, just expand a wee bit further uh, um, how um, it's not necessarily COVID, it might well be the contractor market is particularly affecting the totality of our work program, whether it be renewals or capital renewals or whether it be growth. Um, I think Good probably, question, I know. yeah, no, <laughs> but I'm sure I, it's top of mind for you. Well, I, I think um, we've certainly seen some slowdown uh, and holdups as a result of uh, supply chain issues, uh, not more so than um, seeing uh, a lack of uh, interest from contractors to do to tender and do the work. Um, so that. Supply chain issues are probably um, more obvious at the moment, um, but I would say that as I guess business normalizes um, and we see the rollout of uh, not only our own projects, but uh, you know there, there is a, a wider view of infrastructure and growth development across the region. I think there will be some pretty heady competition to get contractors uh, you know, on tasks. I don't think that's going to become any easier. Um, but at the moment, we're you know, it's it, it's not we're not seeing um, that you know we're just not getting tenders, if you like. So we're still seeing uh, people wanting to do the work. Um, yeah. So is that, is that I mean, without um, uh, trying to jump hurdles before we need to. Are you in any way anticipating a tightening of the contract market? And are there any sort of um, uh, different tactics you're bringing to mitigate the risk that somewhere down the track we we either can't get contractors or probably more likely it will be a contractor's market and they'll start putting their prices up? Mm, prices will reflect inputs. So, you know, we're seeing inflation and prices will go up. Um, but will prices go up? because there's less competition. Um, I tend to think not. Mm. But, um, I think in terms of procurement, certainly the council is already thinking about, uh, you know, um, the procurement methods that we're using. So, um, you know, looking at whether uh, bundled or multi-year uh, contract options may be better to give more certainty to outcomes. Um, so those things are already being thought of. And the other thing that is clearly uh, a good idea and probably becoming more necessary is to uh, engage with the tendering market um, in advance of projects. So to give them clear heads up um, of what's coming uh, because they just become, you know, in a, in a busy marketplace, uh, they just have to have the ability to respond. And if, if they're caught, um, not, you know, prepared or knowing about a project that's going to land um, with them, then they may not be able to do it justice. Yeah. So, so I think early contractor um, engagement to that extent of just making them aware of our timeframes is important mm -hmm. as well. And, and we are doing some of that. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that, Peter. Any other questions for Peter at this stage? There being none, can I uh, uh, recognise we're about to have you, well, soon to get uh, hear from you again, Peter. Can we move to the resolution, please, on page 112, uh, which is that um, uh, we receive the report. Actually, it's got Sharon's name under it rather than Peter's. I'm not quite relaxed about, about that, but I just noticed Sharon has done this uh, rather than you, Pete. So, but yeah, Pete, I was on leave. leave. You've, spoken, on leave. you've spoken to it, mate, so uh, well done. Um, uh, look, I'll move that motion. We receive a report. Can I have a second, please? Thank you, Claire. I'll put the motion, please. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against? It's carried. Thank you very much. Right. I think that gets us to the end of our, um, our mm. public portion of the meeting. Um, yes, Ken. 
Yeah, yeah. So, 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 Bruce, yes, you you have identified that um, correctly. Um, yeah. Now, I was just going to suggest we are running a wee bit ahead of time, which is which is um, quite nice. <laughs> um, so, but what I was going to suggest is, as you've just mentioned, we will be he hearing again from Peter as item number sixteen. Um, my suggestion is that we, um, yeah, we actually um, move ahead now with items fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen, and then, of course, that will um, free up free up Peter. Um, have our lunch break um, between yeah. items 16 and 17. I think that might not be a bad idea. <laughs> um, actually, honest, Ken, I'm just slightly lost, probably lack of preparation on my part. I'm not certain I've seen the resolution to exclude the public. That's not, in my, that's not in my diligent papers. It should be. It probably Ooh, is. But I, it's I, not I, in I, mine either. Oh, yeah, not, okay, it's I, certainly in mine. Either. Page, page, page 115? You don't have a page? Or what's on your page 115? Uh, 115 for me is... Uh, it's, it's, 115 it's, and 116, for some mercurial reason, um, don't don't exist. Yeah, same with me. Same. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, that was my fault, Ken, for not having raised it earlier. Um, are we... Are we um, uh, 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 are we able to proceed um, with your quick verbal update on what the motion is, please? Yeah, uh, yeah certainly, certainly can. Or, or governance team, is it possible for you to project up oh, on the screen the, pages, right pages 115 yeah, and 116? Is that, um, or is that too much of a challenge? <laughs> um, yeah, so sorry about this. It's, it's appearing absolutely fine in my agenda. <laughs> okay. Yeah, governance team, can you can you assist just to project those two pages up or I we'll will just sort that out. Can I email it Thank to you. you, Joe? No, it seems it to me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so sorry about this committee, but we um just just as well we're running ahead of time, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Ken, is there anything, um, just while we're waiting, is there anything with the afternoon's agenda, which I'm very keen we have a light lunch so that we keep ourselves invigorated for the afternoon because it's a very good program. Um, is there anything that you need to raise about this afternoon's program at this stage? I know it's going to be in PX. I don't think there's anything... Uh yeah, no, no, I don't think so. I mean, um, yeah, I'm assuming you've got those agenda items. I'm yeah, we have as far as I can see. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so you'll be, yeah, well, well aware of the nature of them. I mean, obviously, um, item number 17 um, is, um, yeah, is, is um, a fairly comprehensive item and obviously the input of, um, of, three, of three of the um, exec on, on that item. Um, but, yeah, the, the others are, are obviously very, very standard items. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. How are we going, Joe? It's been emailed, Karen. Oh, look at this. Well done. Whew. That's impressive. That's one time when technology helps you a lot, doesn't it? Thank you very much. So um, we have the, uh, the, the motion uh, to move into PX. Um, and we have there on the table uh, the items as we've been uh, aware on our uh, um, thank you on on our agenda. Thank you, Roger. Looks like you're going to move. Do I have a seconder to go into PX? Thank you, Claire. Um, and the relevant staff will be in and out at the right time. So um, I'll put that motion then. Please, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against. <laughs> 